Welcome to Unwired Learning. In this video, we're going to talk about the superposition principle. This is the idea that we can take a circuit that has two sources, or more sources, and we can split the circuit up into its linear components, and we can solve one circuit, then solve the other, and add the results together to get the correct answer for the entire circuit. However, this particular concept can't always be applied to all circuits. These circuits are special because they have all resistances. So we need to determine what kinds of circuits can be analyzed using the source superposition principle. And once we have determined what kinds of circuits can be analyzed, we will perform analysis of those linear circuits. The superposition principle relies on the concept of linear systems. In this case here, I have a linear system inside the box, which for our purposes would be some sort of resistive circuit with dependent and independent sources. And we have an input, we'll call it say x of t, and then we have an output, which is some linear function of x of t. We can say that it's a times x of t. So the question is, what conditions do we have for a linear electrical circuit in order to make sure that we can put the principle of superposition into practice. In this case, the circuit must consist only of resistors, independent sources, and dependent sources. When we say that this particular system has inputs, when it comes to a linear resistive circuit, what we mean by that is that the inputs are either the independent voltages or the independent current sources. And when we hey, say outputs, what do we mean by that? We say, well, we're looking at the voltage across some element in the circuit or the current through an element in the circuit. So what is the superposition principle really saying? In other words, what does it amount to? Well, mathematically, if we have a linear system, which as we just mentioned, can take an input x of t and then transfer it to an output, which would be some value a times x of t, then we can actually express the response of that circuit as a linear sum of inputs. So for instance, if we had some input x1 of t, and then we looked at the response of our circuit, we might get a1 x1 of t. And then if we had another input, let's just say it's x of 2, then if we looked at that response, we would get a2 x2 of t. And the superposition principle says that if we sum these inputs together, then our output will be the linear combination of the responses, a1 x of t plus a2 x2 of t. And of course, we could have more than two inputs. We could have any number of inputs. And of course, we would have then that number of responses that would be summed at the output. When it comes to using the superposition principle on a linear resistive circuit, there's a few rules that we follow when it comes to the types of input sources. We solve the circuit one input at a time. And when we say input, we specifically mean only the independent sources. And we deactivate the other sources. And when we deactivate them, we treat voltage sources as short circuits and current sources as open circuits. Now let's take a look at an example and put the idea of superposition into practice. Over here, you can see I have a simple circuit. I have a 12 volt source here on the left, I have several resistors in between, and then I have a current source of 1.2 amps on the right. I've gone ahead and labeled a couple of the nodes in this circuit. The node here in the middle as V1, and the node here on the right as V2. And I've gone ahead and done the full nodal analysis of this circuit to determine the voltages V1 and V2. Here you can see V1 should be 4.2 volts and V2 should be 4.4 volts. And you can also see that because this is a simple resistive circuit, the nodal analysis here is not actually that complex. We get two sets of simultaneous equations and we have two unknowns, V1 and V2, and we can do a simple matrix operation in something like MATLAB in order to find the voltages. Of course, we don't even have to get that fancy. We could solve it by any number of methods. As the first step of performing superposition, let's deactivate the current source here on the right. And again, to, de to deactivate a current source, we open the current source. And for the sake of it, we'll go ahead and redraw the circuit 
without that current source. When I look at this circuit and I think about doing the analysis on this circuit, I can see that actually I only really need to account for the V1 node and do a nodal analysis at that node. The raw equation of KCL at that node would be V1 minus 12 volts divided by 6 ohms plus V1 over 3 ohms. And for our last term, we can do V1 divided by the sum of 2 ohms and 4 ohms. And all of these currents must equal 0. Now in looking at this, I have 6 ohms, 3 ohms, and of course 6 ohms in the denominator, and therefore I'm going to multiply all the terms by 6 in order to remove our fractions. Multiplying the 6 out, I get V1 minus 12 plus 2V1 plus V1 equals 0. And solving this, I get 4V1s equal 12, which means that V1 equals 3. To find V2 for this, I can recognize that between V1 and V2, we have a resistor voltage divider. So I can use the voltage divider equation with the 2 ohm and 4 ohm resistances to find the value of V2. This expression would look like this. We would say V2 equals V1 times 4 ohms divided by 2 ohms plus 4 ohms. Plugging in the value of 3 volts for V1, and recognizing that the fraction is 2 thirds, we can write that V2 equals 2 volts. Now let's do the second part of the superposition method. We need then to deactivate the voltage source and reactivate the current source. To deactivate the voltage source, that means that we replace the voltage source with a short. And now I'll redraw the circuit with the deactivated voltage source. Here again, we recognize that the best approach would be to do nodal analysis at the V1 and V2 nodes. So for the V1 node, we can write V1 divided by 6 plus V1 divided by 3 plus V1 minus V2 divided by 2 equals 0. The least common denominator for this expression is 6, so let's multiply both sides by 6. That results in an expression of V1 plus 2V1 plus 3V1 minus 3V2 equals 0. Combining all the V1s, we get 6V1 equals 3V2, which means that 2V1s equal V2. Now let's move on and do our equation for node 2. For this node, we get V2 minus V1 divided by 2 ohms plus V2 divided by 4 ohms minus 1.2 amps equals 0. Here we can see that we can multiply both sides by 4 to simplify the expression. Now our expression is 2V2 minus 2V1 plus V2 minus 4.8 equals 0. Combining the V2s and moving the 4.8 to the right, we get minus 2V1 plus 3V2 equals 4.8. Now what we can do is take the expression we derived on the left and plug it into the expression here on the right. Doing so, we get minus 2V1 plus 3 times 2V1 equals 4.8. And so we have a total of 4V1s equals 4.8, which means that V1 equals 1.2 volts. Now plugging that back into the expression on the left, we can solve for V2, and we find that V2 equals 2.4 volts. Now, neither one of these voltages for V1 and V2 are the complete answer. Remember that for the superposition principle, we must add the voltages for each one of the steps where we deactivated a voltage or current source, and we add them together to create the total response of the circuit. So as you might recall from before, we had found that V2 was 2 volts, and we had found that V1 was 3 volts. Summing these up, we find that V2 is 4.4 volts, and V1 is 4.2 volts. And these two expressions for V1 and V2 match the expressions that we expected to get based on our full nodal analysis of the circuit. 4.4 volts for V2 and 4.2 volts for V1. And now we can see that the superposition principle worked at least on this circuit, but it turns out, of course, that this is a universally true phenomenon for all linear resistive circuits. And that concludes this video of Unwired Learning.